G'day and welcome back to Project 200. We've just arrived in Cairns on the way to Cape York, so this video will be part trip report. But given that the 200 is now almost seven years old, it'll also be an update on how the vehicle, the mods and all the accessories are performing so far. I've recently added a few new mods as well, so this trip should be a great test for them. Well, I've been happy with the Mickey Thompson P3s, it was time for a change. So the 200 is now wearing a set of Nitto's new Ridge Grappler tyres in 33 by 12 and a half inch sizing. This is the same diameter as the P3s, but a good 30 millimetres wider and mounted to new ROH Trophy 18 by 9 inch wheels. With the new tyres, I decided to add a tyre pressure monitoring system for additional safety. So we'll see how that performs as well. The final new mod, and the one I've really been looking forward to, is a transmission software remap from Richards Auto, who make the lockup kit that I've been running for the last five years. The remap modifies the operation of the transmission, particularly the holding of fifth and sixth gears, and also smooths out changes when the lockup kit is active. The first 2000 k's of the trip was really a quick transit run, up the inland highways from Sydney to Cairns. With the camper trailer in tow, we leave here and work our way up to Weeper, and from there, up to Bamaga. Switching between the development road and the telly track, depending on how the conditions are at the time. We'll then gradually make our way back to Cairns, then we'll head back home to Sydney, via the Bruce, Pacific and New England highways. All up, the trip will be around 8,000 kilometres over about five weeks. From Cairns, we drove north via the Bloomfield track, through the Daintree Rainforest staying at the Lion's Den Hotel. We continued on towards Weeper via the Peninsula Development Road. The PDR dirt to this point was in pretty good condition without any severe corrugations, and the amount of sealed road is constantly growing. There are also some massive sections of roadworks along the way. It probably won't be too long before it's tar all the way to Weeper. After staying in Weeper for a few days, we headed straight across to Batavia Downs on the Telegraph Road. We then turned north towards Bramwell Junction, where we started our journey up the infamous Old Telegraph Track. The OTT is a rough and tight four-wheel drive track, totally unsuitable for caravans, no matter how off-road they may be. It is suitable for true off-road camper trailers if they're durable enough. The first challenge we came across on the ATT was Palm Creek, just a few kilometres from the junction. The creek itself wasn't deep, but the exit was steep, rutted and muddy. We decided it looked drivable, so we put some max tracks into one of the ruts and gave it a crack. We made it through unassisted, although the last climb had the 200's traction control system scrabbling for grip for a few seconds before it found traction and powered out. Continuing up the ATT, there were several other creek crossings to negotiate, but none were difficult. The widest crossing was Birdie Creek, but with a solid rock base and shallow water, it was an easy crossing to reach the campsite on the other side where we spent the night. We'd originally decided to bypass Gunshot Creek, but doubled back for a look and decided to make the crossing. A trip to the Cape wouldn't be complete without Gunshot. This was the first of the deep river crossings, with the north to south run taking us up the creek through clear water around a metre deep. Coming back through from the south, the well-known vertical drop seemed a little bit too much, particularly with the trailer in tow so we elected to take the second steepest entry. Descending slowly wasn't a problem, especially with the assistance of the trailer brakes holding us back. The main crossing at the bottom was around 900 millimetres deep, with the exit only slightly eroded. So it didn't present any serious problems and we were soon on our way north again. The next crossing at Cockatoo Creek looked quite difficult and wide, but with a solid rock base it was just a matter of taking the correct line. 
This turned out to be straight up alongside the creek bank for about 50 metres, then across the creek to the exit. Unfortunately, our travelling companion sliced open a tyre on this crossing after hitting a sharp submerged rock. Not long after Cockatoo Creek, we briefly rejoined the Bamaga Road, which is fantastic if you happen to love corrugations. A few kilometres later, we turned back onto the OTT and headed to Canal Creek for a couple of nights, right next door to Elliot and Twin Falls. These beautiful waterfalls and swimming holes are a highlight of the trip and an absolute must-see as you head up the telly track. Continuing our journey up the OTT, the next interesting crossing is Sam Creek. The entry was quite steep and eroded, but the creek itself and the exit wasn't a problem, and we were quickly on our way again. Just north of Sam Creek is your last chance to leave the OTT for the Bamaga Road, before the deep crossings of Cannibal, Logans and Nolans. If you continue to Nolans, then decide it's too deep, then it's very difficult to backtrack the 20 kilometres to Sam Creek, as the southbound exit of Logans is steep and muddy. The next crossing is Cannibal Creek, with a short steep entry down to water that's around 900 millimetres deep with a sandy base. The track hairpins around to the right, then follows a washed out exit. Without lockers, it was up to the traction control to keep the 200 moving. The next challenge was the Cypress Creek Log Bridge, which is in a constant state of collapse and repair, with new logs added as old ones break or are washed away during the wet season. This year it was barely wider than the 200, but strong and stable, so it was just a matter of getting a guide so we didn't slip off. Continuing north, the next major crossing was Logan's Creek, a long, silty crossing with a steep and muddy initial entry into metre deep water. Although deep, this was a relatively easy crossing heading north, with good traction and a gentle exit. After leaving Logan's, we came to a long, swampy area of mud and water, which looked quite difficult, but had a solid base and gave us no problems. Soon after leaving the swamp, we came upon over a dozen vehicles lined up waiting to attempt the infamous Nolans Brook. After watching several other vehicles make the attempt, we picked the line, hooked up a strap just in case, and headed across. The water was around 1.2 metres or 4 feet deep for the first half of the crossing, with a short, steep, sandy climb out to shallower water. Here it is again from outside the car, showing just how high the water is and the scrabble as the cruiser climbs out of the deepest section. Soon after the Nolans crossing, it was time to leave the OTT and head back to the Bamaga Road, and then on to the Jardine River Ferry. This ferry could possibly be the most expensive trip in Australia, at a cost of $130 for the 200 metre return journey. So we've finally reached the top of the Cape York Peninsula, the northernmost point of mainland Australia. The drive up the telegraph track was incredible, and absolutely something you should try to do if you have the chance. After spending almost a week staying at Punsan Bay right on the waterfront, plus a trip out to some of the Torres Strait Islands, we'll head south tomorrow. We had planned on visiting Chili Beach, but apparently the track isn't suitable for trailers. So instead, we'll go straight to Lakefield National Park via the soothing corrugations of the Bamaga and Peninsula Development Roads. On our way south, we stopped briefly at Fruit Bat Falls. It's another beautiful swimming hole and waterfall located right next to one of the OTT Bamaga Road intersections. Continuing down the Bamaga Road, we spent the night at Bramwell Station, where despite the remote location, you'll find a buffet barbecue and live music every single night. It's well worth the stop. Continuing down the Telegraph Road from Bramwell, our next night was back at Musgrave Station, and from here we headed east into Lakefield National Park. There were some amazing sights here, with the road taking us in through the Nyfield Plain Termite Mounds, before we set up camp at the Cowpower Crossing Campground, where pre-booking is essential.
Here we discovered our first crocodile of the trip, sunning himself on the riverbank just across from the campground. Lakefield brought the off-road section of our trip to an end, and from here we returned to Cairns for an amazing trip out onto the Great Barrier Reef, for a snorkel amongst the coral and the marine life. It's a must-see if you're heading up this way. So after 8,500 kilometres, we're back home in the Blue Mountains. This has already been a pretty long video, so I'll just briefly cover a few bits and pieces about how the 200 has performed. Have a read of the article on the website for a detailed report on every modification. The 200 itself was performing brilliantly until a few days ago, but the starter motor has just started playing up occasionally. Fortunately, the car's already booked in at Dynamotive in Melbourne next week for a full intake and EGR clean, plus a catch can install. So I'll get them to replace the starter while they're in there, and I'll post an update once I know what's going on. The new Nido Ridge Grappler tyres have performed brilliantly on the trip, with no failures or punctures. Their general off-road performance and traction on the dirt roads was excellent, and they're a much quieter tyre than the P3s they replaced. I really can't fault them. The tyre pressure monitoring system was fantastic as well, allowing me to keep an eye on pressure and temperature throughout the trip. I should have installed one years ago. Finally, I absolutely love the transmission remap in combination with the lockup kit. The 200 now happily holds sixth gear on the highway, even up decent inclines, with similar results for fifth gear on the fast dirt. It's the way Toyota should have set up the gearbox. I've put a lot more information about the trip, including our full itinerary and plenty of still images on the Project 200 website. There's also a detailed report on every modification and accessory, so please click through and have a look. See you next time.